So thank you, thank you all this morning uh, for joining us there in Indonesia and from other far-flung parts of the world. Uh, we're here today for the CEIA Indonesia webinar on global standards for renewable energy accounting. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning. Not a good sound. We'll get through that. All right. So just some uh, initial uh, initial points here to make. Uh, you guys have all probably logged in and figured out the uh, mics and the speakers and things like that. Uh, if you have challenges with the computer, you can also call in uh, and uh, and connect yourself in that way. As I mentioned, uh, some people may have missed, but we're going to be doing the audience uh, on microphones off mode uh, for the. Uh, main portion of the presentation here. Uh, any questions you have regarding Rex uh, and presentation, things that you want to go to the presenters themselves, uh, you can put that through the questions pane down at the bottom. Uh, it should be generally on the right side of your, your screen there. If you have other technical questions that you need to ask, you can uh, put those in through the, the chat box and uh, direct those to particular people or to uh, to the group as a whole. Uh, and just so you all are aware, we're going to be re recording this presentation and editing out uh, some of it for length. And uh, we'll be posting this up to a YouTube page. So know that you're being recorded. And there's the link down there. And we can send that out to folks, too. Or send if you have any questions about that, uh, let me know uh, after the presentation. All right. So just a, a quick introduction here. We're going to go uh, first. Uh, the basic background of why we're why we have this webinar. We've got uh, Almo is going to give a little bit of background on that, and then he'll talk about CEIA also uh, to kind of give a perspective of where where this is coming from and uh, what the purpose of the presentation is. Uh, after that, the the bulk of the presentation will will be provided by Sam Kubrick, who's going to be. Uh, he's from NREL, and he'll be uh, covering uh, primary topics of introducing corporate renewable energy commitments, uh, discussing how RECs fit in with procurement pathways uh, and how they're used to meet those renewable energy targets, and then providing more some specific detail on RE100 requirements, as a lot of the working group members uh, are RE100 members as well. Uh, following on from that, we'll have uh, three experts uh, to help provide insights from the uh, market sector as well. So we've got uh, APX, uh, Mount Stonegate Green Asset Management, and the Center for Resource Solutions. They'll be providing uh, discussion at the end after Sam goes. And then we'll have a brief Q&A session, uh, or I guess if it doesn't have to be too brief, depending on the questions. So uh, with that... I will pass it over to Almo. Thanks, Rob. So good morning, good evening, everyone. This is Almo Pradana from WRI Indonesia. And we are having now around six people here in WRI Indonesia office, uh, um, uh, you know, listening in and watching Rob uh, uh, about to present about, uh, you know, the renewable energy certificates um, uh, technical discussion. So a little bit about the CEIA. Um, you can see from the slides that these are the, you know, these are the reasons uh, why we are initiating the uh, Clean Energy Investment Accelerator Initiative. So, um, in a nutshell, basically, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are together uh, thinking of um, uh, leveraging the RE100 commitment to to ensure that there are significant and powerful contribution from the. Uh, uh, potential, uh, you know, companies that will uh, that will be able to purchase uh, renewable energy and do their part to reduce emission by 2020. So, um, um, CIA uh, in Indonesia is is gaining ground since last year. We have done um, uh, several, uh, uh, you know, uh, working group discussions and meetings, high level meetings, with the potential buyers, but also with the uh, private sector, uh, with the potential buyers, and also with the uh, government uh, stakeholders. And uh, some of the uh, areas that we are working on is definitely, um, um, you know, promoting policy, uh, uh, regulatory and financial uh, uh, technical discussions, and also uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, initiatives that we will be working together uh, with the uh, uh, private sector buyers here. One of the uh, activities, so we, so, so of course we have activities uh, uh, this year as well, uh, similar to last year. 
But this year, we are working on ensuring that we laid out all options on our table to ensure that uh, you know our our working group members, uh, the private sectors that that have interest to that have interest to procure more renewable energy, know their options about about how to advance that targets. One of them is, of course, uh, renewable energy certificates, a policy that has not yet been officiated uh, officiated in Indonesia. So it's uh, you know the topic of REC has been discussed a lot in various uh, forums. Uh, 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 mainly by international development partners and also some of the uh, um, government officials as well, but nothing has been, uh, uh, you know, um, taken up. So uh, based on our last discussion uh, um, with uh, the potential buyers, our, 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 you know, our colleagues uh, and, and, and companies that we are working with, uh, seems that uh, um, the time is right for us to discuss about the technicalities of renewable energy certificates. And of course, one of our partner, one of our partner, which is Enwell, uh, alongside the other partners, uh, um, are going to uh, are in the best place to to to, to illustrate, uh, explain, and discuss and lead the discussion about this renewable energy certificate. So, I think that's it from me. Uh, I'm not sure whether uh, Gina want to add anything. Apparently, she's uh, shaking her head. So, mm -hmm. I'm returning the mic back to Rob. Unmuted. Great. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Trying to make sure we've got some questions here on technical issues. I think we're okay. <clears throat> um, thank you very much for that, Almo. Uh, just to give a little bit of additional background on on CEIA, kind of where we are coming from in uh, as a, a global organization, <clears throat> CEIA is. Uh, works as a uh, public-private partnership that's working to address barriers at, uh, uh, to scale clean energy and, and advanced energy development. We do that th basically through three uh, pillars that we look at. The policy pipeline, in which we work on uh, enabling environments and <clears throat> work with various uh, stakeholders in that environment to make sure uh, that we're addressing some of the policy issues that are holding back renewables development. Uh, and to do that, we work with purchasers uh, largely to help them figure out or help them discuss and bring to the forefront what their challenges are uh, in terms of uh, why they're unable to uh, to purchase renewables uh, and get those uh, as available uh, possibilities through the market and to try to address those, those uh, typical issues that they may be running through. Uh, and then based on that, we're, we work to develop pipelines of projects. Uh, we're doing this uh, across uh, several different markets. Primarily now we're working in Mexico, Colombia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. Uh, all of these have different issues, as you can imagine, or different challenges. Uh, so there's a different approach within each of these markets. The team that we have is made up is, is made up of three different partners. We've got Alatro Partners, WRI, and NREL. Uh, all of these partners that we have bring different levels of expertise to the team, and they help us cover uh, specific technical areas. So that's uh, a good way for us to bring different skills uh, in these various markets that have different challenges and allow us to kind of match our needs to, to the market as we uh, encounter different challenges. So after that short introduction, I'll pass it off to Sam. Sam is a researcher here uh, at uh, NREL. He's uh, working on other, uh, in other markets as well for CEIA. He's working in the Philippines and today he'll be providing us uh, an introduction to corporate renewable energy commitments and a deeper discussion on REC. Okay, so I'm excited to have a uh, uh, such a great working group. I know that everyone is really eager to learn more about renewables here. And I think uh, my job is going to be kind of four things today. Um, explaining what voluntary renewable commitments exist, uh, talking about how renewable purchase how renewable purchases are tracked and accounted for around the world, uh, what procurement options are in Indonesia currently, and then kind of taking a deep dive on RE100 because I know that's a uh, commitment that a lot of corporates that the people on this webinar work for. And so talking specifically about what the technical criteria that RE100 requires uh, uh, for you. So 
to start off with, two of the big commitments as we see more global co companies making RE commitments uh, and, and greenhouse gas redu reduction commitments are science-based targets and RE100. So science-based targets takes a sectoral approach. So uh, corporates are given a carbon budget based on what sector they're in, based on their market cap within that sector. And so this reaches beyond just renewable electricity. Um, there's actually three scopes that it reaches. First is scope one, which is direct emissions from owned and controlled sources. So this is like factories. Uh, scope two is indirect emissions from generation of purchased energy. So this is renewable energy purchases. And scope three is upstream and downstream emissions in the supply chain. So this can be really hard to quantify for some corporates, but science-based targets provide some really helpful methodology. And so if you have made a commitment or your corporate has made a commitment to science-based targets, um, you need to develop a, a target plan and work out how in each of these scopes what your emissions are. RE100, on the other hand, really only dives into that scope two sector of, uh, or, or area. Um, so only purchase electricity. And specifically, it's looking at maximizing renewable electricity uh, through a 100% commitment. Now, RE100 itself doesn't specify what a target year or an end year for that 100% renewable commitment is, but a lot of members have set 2030 with then some sort of intermediary saying that 50% renewables by 2020 or 2025. Um, and I think it's really important to emphasize that this isn't small potatoes. We're talking about a lot of uh, demand here coming from a, a pretty wide range of, of corporates. We have about 166 um, corporates that are involved in RE100. And combined, they have, uh, if, if RE100 were a country, they would have the 23rd highest electricity demand in the world. Um, so about equivalent size of Thailand. So uh, if all of these companies meet their commitments, we're talking about a, a pretty large slice of the pie here. Finally, CDP, which itself doesn't make any commitments or organize any commitments or pledges, but CDP is a really important disclosure tool, um, and it also serves as a platform to report things like greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, carbon footprints, and also renewable purchases through PPAs or other instruments. And so CDP really exists to kind of bind together commitments and make sure that commitments are, are being made in a way that's disclosed and open. And the idea behind that is to provide information for consumers, but also to encourage other corporates in the same sector as you perhaps to also make the same commitments so that everyone's kind of playing on the same playing field. So we have a Venn diagram here that kind of goes over a lot of what I just said, but I'd like to go over a couple examples that kind of demonstrate where these are different commitments because a lot of corporates might find themselves with a commitment to both science-based targets and RE100 and also have to be reporting information to CDP. And all of these support voluntary renewable energy uh, procurement, but in different ways. So RE100, uh, an example of this is HP, uh, the, the giant tech firm. Um, they went from 16% RE in 2016 to 50% in 2017. So they made a giant leap uh, in just one year. And so that kind of really demonstrates that, you know, it might seem very daunting to make a 100% renewable commitment, but you can make gradual progress, but you can also make giant leaps towards this. Um, so HP actually surpassed their 2020 interim target of 40%. Meanwhile, an example of a science-based target is Coca-Cola HBC, which is the European bottler and distributor of Coca-Cola. So they have a science-based target to reduce their scope one and two emissions 50% uh, by 2020 and their scope one, two, and three. So that's accounting for their entire supply chain, including uh, transportation and, and, and other, other elements uh, to reduce their scope one, two, and three emissions 25% by 2020. So that's an example how, you know, RE100 and science-based targets, electricity is a key component of that, and that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today, but that's just kind of one slice of the pie for some of this. Uh, CDP then, an example of that is Infosys, which is a Indian uh, information technology for firm. They recently procured 46.1 megawatts of solar PV, mostly on site, and they've announced this uh, through uh, CDP. Um, and, and use that as kind of a disclosure platform to show how much renewables they have and how much uh, non-renewables they have. Um, so while there isn't a, a commitment there, it is still interacting with other components like RE100. So I think we need to briefly kind of back up just to get everyone on the same level and just talk about what a REC is and how a REC is used when we're making an RE claim. So when you have a megawatt hour of electricity generated, uh, by a renewable generator, there are two valuable assets that are actually created. The first is the electricity. Um, 
And then the second is a REC. The problem and why a REC was developed is that as soon as a generator puts their electricity into the grid, those electrons just join everyone else's electrons. And there's no way to tell whose electricity in a wire is whose electricity, what generator it's coming from. So a REC is created simultaneously to that electricity, and it kind of acts as a financial instrument, like a, like a stock or a bond, and it certifies that uh, one megawatt hour generally of renewable electricity was created, and then it's an owned asset by that generator. Um, now, a lot of times, and we'll talk about procurement mechanisms later, that REC is like traded or, or attached to the electricity that's supplied to an end user. So if a corporate signs a PPA, for instance, they not only get the electricity, which is put into the grid, but they also get the REC kind of simultaneously. So the retirement of a REC uh, signifies when you take that, that financial instrument and you, you make a signification on it that it can no longer be traded, it won't be claimed by anyone else. So retiring a REC is kind of a, a very physical and temporal moment where you are saying, we are using this claim of renewable uh, uh, generation uh, and no one else can going forward. So uh, REC tracking systems then become very important. And these kind of serve as markets, but they also serve as a way to you know, recognize the creation of a REC, then to track that REC as it's traded or bought or sold between different parties or corporates, and then finally to retire that REC. And these tracking systems serve as a really important accounting mechanism to make sure that no double counting takes place. So I think I just explained what a renewable energy certificate is and a, a REC tracking system as well. And I think some of the uh, presenters will have later on, uh, like EPX and IREX can really talk more about tracking systems and some of the nuance there. Um, the final thing I want to bring up is just an unbundled REC purchase. And so as a REC is kind of like a financial instrument, you can purchase RECs without purchasing the electricity associated with them. And so in a lot of places, that is the method that's used to meet renewable targets, whether they're voluntary or mandatory. But having a REC, whether you purchased it unbundled, so you didn't purchase the electricity alongside it, or you purchased it attached to some electricity, these are both valid ways of procuring RECs. So again, RECs are really an accounting mechanism. If RECs didn't exist and in markets where they don't exist, we often have to verify renewable energy ownership and claims of environmental attributes from renewable energy by like tracing complicated contract pathways or uh, expensive audits. RECs are really designed just to simplify this whole process and really provide public accountability and a clear ownership system of who owns renewable generation once that generation is inserted or injected into the wider grid. Because once those electrons get into the grid, there's no telling whose energy is, whose electricity is, whose electricity. So the REC's really there to account for that. Um, so WRI, which is part of the CEIA, uh, they have set out some quality criteria for scope two. Uh, reminder again, scope two is the scope of emissions tracking, specifically looking at electricity generation and purchases. So they have some criteria for what a REC or renewable energy certificate really should be and what it should hold. So A, it should convey GHG information, greenhouse gas. Uh, so this is to say what the carbon savings are, or in the case of biomass or, or some other renewable fuel types that might have a GHG cost associated with them, what that is. It should be an exclusive claim. So again, this is to avoid double counting. Multiple people cannot own the same REC. It has to be traded or sold between them. And once you sell it or trade a REC, you can no longer make a claim to that REC. So just because you used to generate renewable electricity or you made a renewable purchase, if you don't retain those RECs associated with that renewable purchase, you no longer can make that claim of renewables. So this is really relevant in cases with like a utility, say if like PLN owns a fair amount of renewables and they want to tell all of their customer base that they are getting X percent of their electricity from renewables, they can't also sell those RECs. PLN in this case will need to hold those RECs. Finally, RECs should be retired in order to make that claim of uh, renewable environmental usage. Um, they should match up to an inventory period. We'll talk about this a bit later, but generally, like if you're claiming in 2017 that you used 50% renewable electricity, at the same time, your RECs should also be from 2017 or from a more granular period on, on a month level, maybe. And finally, they should be sourced from the same market as the company. Um, there is some... Uh, 
disagreement as what market actually entails here. But for the most part, a, a country, especially in the case of Indonesia, you know, the RECs should be from Indonesia. So that is how we secure credible and verifiable claims from a REC. But looking beyond that, a lot of corporates are interested in how they can be really impactful with their REC purchases. So a couple of organizations have come out to look at, you know, what are the most impactful RECs in terms of reducing GHG emissions and bringing more renewables on the grid. The first is Green E Energy Standard. And so this has its largest presence in the US, Canada, and, and Singapore recently. And so Green E requires RE generators to be 15 years old or newer. So you can't have a old legacy hydro uh, installation that you're using to procure RECs. Um, it sets limits on like the types of resources too. Uh, again, resources like hydro and biomass are considered renewable by some and not renewable by others. And I don't think it's really helpful to, for, for us to take a stance on, on that debate, but rather I think we need to talk about a concept called additionality. And so additionality is a concept that really is signifying that the purchase of a REC will directly contribute to the development of new renewable resources on a grid rather than just supporting resources that have already been there. And so when a, a corporate is thinking about buying renewables, they really should be thinking how they can do this in the most impactful manner. And things like the Green E standard support that. The Buyer's Principle is a, is a project in the U.S., and it's an organization that looks at supporting RE projects that reduce emissions beyond business as usual. And so that is looking at the most impactful places where renewables um, could be creating and maybe valuing those RECs at a higher price. And that's an important point too. RECs don't all have the same price. Different resource types, different years that they're generated in. Uh, these all can be priced at, at different points in some sort of a rec market or a rec tracking system. And finally, RE100 provides some leadership guidance um, on their website that, that provides how like citing projects locally and uh, looking at new projects and developing in underdeveloped markets usually has a larger social and environmental impact. And so that's really if a corporate is trying to be as impactful as possible, that's the method they should they should pursue. So now I think it's helpful to look at RECs as a procurement pathway to meet RE targets. And so I think it's helpful to kind of go through some different procurement options. And these are procurement options that are available globally. And so not all of these are available in Indonesia right now, and we'll talk about that later. But these are kind of the options that generally we see around the world. So corporate ownership is direct ownership and it involves the corporate, you know, making a capital expenditure or investing their own equity or accepting some debt to purchase a renewable system. And generally, they're also accepting operations and maintenance costs for that system too. So this requires a large upfront investment, but largely, usually can also result in, in the largest savings in terms of electricity. In this case, if the project is on site, you know, rec tracking might involve verifiable claims uh, through a meter and, and the, the system would be metered on site. And then a, that, that metered information could be entered into a rec tracking system. There's no intermediary, though. The recs would be directly deposited in kind of the rec account of the corporate, and then the corporate could just retire those immediately. Or if, if this is located off-site, there again would probably be a meter and maybe there's an intermediary, but these are going right to the, the, uh, the corporate's account. So in a PPA, there's a lot of different flavors of a PPA, um, and PPAs can be located on-site or off-site. However, the system is usually still owned by a developer or an independent power producer that the corporate contracts with. So in this case, that independent power producer is responsible for, for getting the RECs once they're created, and then they transfer those RECs, uh, usually attached or bundled, um, with the electricity they sell to an off-taker. And Generally, then the corporate or the off taker pays a single per kilowatt hour price for all electricity, which includes those recs. But in this case, we need to make sure that those recs aren't being double counted, that the generator isn't selling them elsewhere. A utility green tariff involves a utility uh, going out and procuring renewable electricity, either developing it themselves or going through a request for proposals process to accept proposals from different developers, developing renewable electricity and then selling it to their existing customer base. And how this works usually is on the generation charge of a corporate's bill. On the electricity bill, there's generally a specific line item for generation. That is just replaced with the 
the, the fossil fuel generation to a new renewable generation line item. And so that price might be different. It could be higher. It could be lower. It depends on exact economics. Um, and in some cases, the utility wants to, to take something on top too. But uh, in this case, Rex should be transferred with the sale of electricity to the uh, subscriber to the utility green tariff. Finally, unbundled certificates um, could be generated by a generator that is not otherwise selling Rex. So in the case that a generator is selling Rex um, to a... Uh, uh, and no, sorry, in the case that a generator is not selling Rex, but is just selling the electricity uh, from a wind turbine, for instance, they can hold on to those Rex and then they can sell them kind of at their leisure or they could contract them in, in a contract of one to three years. And so a corporate is procuring Rex without actually procuring the power associated with those. So I just want to really quickly go over these. We have some great di diagrams from an old uh, NREL uh, publication um, that really explain this. And I think this publication, we can provide a link, is really helpful to read through if you're having some trouble understanding some of these contracts. So a PPA is a contract that we see at the top signed between the customer and the generator. And then the power comes through the utility uh, which usually charges a wheeling charge of some sort or charges for the delivery of the power through their wires. But then the rec and the power goes on to the customer and the payment is going between the customer and the generator here. Um, in the case of a utility green tariff, a generator is selling electricity to the utility along with the rec. And then the utility is passing that electricity and the rec onto the customer. And again, this electricity is usually replacing a line item generation charge on the customer's bill. So a corporate with a generation charge on their bill now has a uh, renewable generation purchase or something of the sort. And the customer continues just to pay the utility. In the case of unbundled certificates, a corporate can be buying RECs from a generator that they have no connection to in terms of the actual grid. For instance, if you're a corporate located on an island or, or, so, or the generator is located on an island, there doesn't need to be a physical way that power can get to you, but the REC can still be transferred and sold to you, and you still receive those environmental attributes that entitle you to make a claim of renewable energy usage. So you continue to buy your electricity from the utility, PLN, but you purchase RECs separately, which allow you to make those claims of environmental usage. Um, one thing about unbundled certificates is, again, you need to be paying attention to the quality of the RECs you're buying. In other cases, like direct procurement and the PPAs, you can go to a physical site and say, this is you know, where the, this is the site we built. This is an additional renewable resource that we brought online. And sometimes that's not always true with unbundled certificates. But I think that when we can make that physical connection, when you can point to an actual new renewable generator that came online because of your support and your rec purchase, that's a lot more impactful. And I think as consumers grow more cognizant and look to dig into these things, we need to be aware that that's something they're looking for too. So what's actually available in Indonesia of these different procurement uh, methods? Um, there isn't anything that's really a home run right now. Uh, corporate ownership is allowed and probably has the least regulation involved, especially if it's located on site and it's for self-procurement. And there are some tax incentives in existence. There's also programs like net metering and feed-in tariffs, which allow you to sell excess generation to the grid and receive a payment back for that. However, in these cases of net metering and feed-in tariffs, you're likely forfeiting your RECs um, and you're likely selling those RECs. So we need to think if you're trying to meet RE100 commitment, uh, entering a program like net metering or feed-in tariffs is probably not ideal. PPAs are illegal in Indonesia. Uh, I, I don't have a ton of expertise on this. I think others on this call probably could help fill you in better. Um, but there is a fair amount of permitting from what I understand. And there isn't a really standardized wheeling arrangement. That is, wheeling fee is the amount that you pay the utility, so PLN, to actually deliver the electricity because you're still using their wires. The generator just connects to their wires and you have to pay them kind of like a postage stamp to use their wires. And there isn't a clear arrangement or policy that dictates what that is. Um, most of that, as I understand, is, is organized ad hoc. So that would be a separate negotiation. 
Um, a utility green tariff doesn't exist in, in PLN territory right now, but we've seen examples in the U.S. of an aggregated group of corporates, such as the ones on this webinar right now, uh, approaching a utility and requesting a green tariff and the utility actually being responsive. And so in this case, an, an aggregated group of, of corporates could say, hey, PLN, our net load or, or our peak demand is 200 megawatts and we want a 200 megawatt solar plant. And then PLN would either develop that plant themselves or they would issue a request for proposals, an RFP, for developers to develop a 200 megawatt solar plant. And then, as we said, they would replace the fossil fuel generation charge on those corporate's bills with a renewable charge and pass those recs through. So in a case like this, even though PLN would be receiving the power contractually, they wouldn't be able to make, PLN couldn't make a renewable claim to that power. And so something to be suspicious or, or wary of is a utility trying to create a green tariff program, but not passing along RECs. And that's where having a really good tracking system to ensure that you're the only one receiving that REC is really important. And finally, unbundled certificates. Uh, as I understand, there is no you know, fortified REC market right now in Indonesia, but we have some private companies on the call who, who are really looking that direction. And it sounds like there is a, a political buy-in at some level within Indonesia. So I just want to go over some examples of valid and invalid uses of RECs and RE use claims. So in a valid uh, offsite RE use claim for a PPA, for instance, that's this first one here. We have the generator, which is providing its electricity. It's going through the utility, a wheeling fee, as we said, that postage stamp is being paid to the utility, and then any financial value is being passed on to the customer. And that financial value can be stability. Um, renewable PPAs typically are very stable and uh, electricity rates in Indonesia can not be stable. And so having that stable 20 year PPA, 15 year PPA, where you know you're paying the exact price for electricity for every year in that can be really helpful. But separately, that REC is also passed along, which we see at the bottom there. So this REC gets passed from the generator to the corporate, and then they can claim that renewable energy usage. So this is a valid offsite PPA. Another valid uh, offsite claim could be unbundled. So in this case, we have the same generator, and it's providing just energy to the grid, electricity to the grid. But it's that electricity it's providing to the grid isn't really technically considered renewable because the utility or whoever's purchasing it on the grid isn't purchasing the REC with it. Instead, the generator is separately contracted or through a marketplace selling that REC onto a corporate. And so the corporate who buys that REC there is the one who's legally entitled to make the claim of uh, renewable energy usage. So in this case, the corporate could continue buying their electricity from the utility, but be purchasing that REC separately. So these are now invalid use claims for RECs. And so this is what is not allowed. So in this first one, we have an on-site claim. So we have a generator on-site. It's more likely instead of a wind turbine, this would be like a rooftop solar panel. But in any case, we have uh, an on-site renewable generator and the electricity is being consumed on-site. However, the corporate who, who owns this generator is selling that REC in a REC market. And so they realize there's an additional value stream for them there, and maybe they choose to take it. However, uh, at this point, they can't be making that claim of environmental usage once they sell that REC. Okay. Um, Another invalid offsite RE claim would be in this case where we have a generator uh, offsite. So maybe this is a wind turbine, or it could also be a, a group of solar panels, and they're selling their electricity onto the grid, and that financial value is being passed through to the consumer, um, but then that wreck is being sold separately into the market. And so in this case, even though you might contract with a solar generator to, say, uh, procure X percent of your electricity from, from renewables, uh, or sorry, even though you may contract with a, a renewable generator to be providing your electricity, unless you're purchasing that REC additionally, um, it's, it's not a, a valid claim. Uh, hey, Sam, another example funny. here Can of you guys hear me? tracking is, is just what a tracking system actually looks like. And we kind of covered this on the WRI slide earlier. So, a REC containing the clean energy attributes of like one megawatt, so one REC, generally going to contain data like the location, the type of the resource, uh, the date of the generation, um, the project age, 
and the mission profile of the local grid. So you can really make a comparison between, uh, you know, is this adding more renewables to a place where it's actually needed or not? One important thing to bring up here again is the concept again of additionality, wherein additionality is just because we we have all this data and we can kind of make our own judgment call and assessment of if a rec is of a certain merit, if it's high enough quality, um, we shouldn't just be buying the cheapest recs, although for some that, that could also be an option to make a legal environmental attribute claim um, or, envi or, or renewable energy usage. The really important thing, though, is that once a rec enters a tracking system, it can only be uh, the entity who actually retires the rec. So maybe that is the person who buys it directly from the generator, or maybe it gets traded and bought and sold 100 different times between 100 different corporates. In either case, once it is retired in the end, it can no longer be bought or sold. And it's that entity who retires it that owns the right to make a REC uh, usage claim, to make a claim to the renewable attributes of that REC. Okay. So RECs can be bought and sold until they are retired. Again, like I said, a, a REC, once it enters a tracking system, it can be bought and sold 100 times by 100 different agents. And it, its price can increase and it can decrease. It's really market forces that determine that. Um, but once it's finally retired, it can no longer enter that process. Uh, and again, there are some best practices uh, that exist for what sort of recs you should be looking for if you are making these unbundled purchases. So generally, uh, they should be, again, in the sim a similar location. It should be a similar time period. And uh, it should be a similar technology type to the technologies that the the uh, corporate is is claiming that they're using. So if, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a corporate has a bunch of promotional material they're putting out showing solar panels and saying that they use 100% renewable energy, it's best practice that they actually are purchasing solar recs rather than, say, biomass recs or, or hydro recs or something of that sort. The message you want to put out should actually be the recs that you're buying. So now I think it's useful to head into and dig into the technical criteria of what RE100 actually requires. I think that RE100 is a commitment that a lot of people on this call in this, in this webinar might be part of, their corporate. And so I think a lot of questions will be centered around there. RE100's requirements also are pretty typical of other commitments. And so if you're party to a different commitment, a lot of this could be applicable, but you should still ask to see technical criteria to see the fine print of what sort of renewables you actually need to meet that commitment you pledged. So a thing with RE100 is that uh, a lot of people think it's just large tech firms like the Apples and the Googles of the world that are procuring energy through RE100 and are making claims that to use 100% renewable energy. But we can see that that's not really the case. If we look at this left graph down here, we can see that technology is by but is but in no means a majority stake of the terawatt hours, so total consumption that is uh, enlisted or has committed to RE100. And so here in this left graph, we can see that consumer staples, uh, food and beverage materials are also really significant sectors. And so the image of just, you know, again, the Apples and the Googles of the world participating in RE100 couldn't be further from the truth. This image in the right shows the participating terawatt hours, so the total consumption by the headquarters of the company who made the commitment um, by region. And so we can see that most companies participating in RE100 are headquartered in Europe or America, um, although there are a few in Asia Pacific. But it's really important to note that RE100 commitments and most other commitments need to be met at a facility level for companies rather than at a company-wide level. And so if we take the example of Coca-Cola, they're headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, but they can't buy a ton of recs or buy all of their recs and all of their renewables in the United States. They need to buy their recs in the markets uh, wherever their facilities are located. So if Coca-Cola has a bottler in Jakarta, that 
corporate there needs to also be procuring recs to meet that facility's need. So looking into the specific technical criteria of RE100, and there are actually very few specific requirements um, established by RE100, but again, there are considerations and there's judgments that need to be made uh, by the corporate when uh, assessing uh, the accessibility of their renewable purchases and the merit and really the, the image that they want to be portraying. So these considerations include the procurement mechanism they're going with. Uh, for instance, if a corporate really wants solar panels on their rooftop to really demonstrate in your face that they have renewables, that's something maybe they should be looking at uh, rather than buying recs from an unspecified mechanism where they can't really point to the solar panels on their rooftop. They also need to be considering technology, uh, although things like uh, palm oil or, or biomass might be abundant in Indonesia, these aren't always the best options when considering the long-term carbon impact uh, and also uh, considering uh, the actual benefits to the grid and, and, and to the environment. The location of the generator also. Unbundled rec purchases can be really great at scaling up renewables in locations where it's most cost effective to build them. And so in some cases, it does make sense to make unbundled rec purchases from a location with a lot of sunlight, for instance. There's If there's high resource availability, then Citing a generator in, in that position, even if it's not directly connected to the corporate's grid, even if it's on a different island group per se, could still make a lot of sense. Uh, but on the other hand, citing a generator locally or you know on in your backyard can really also make a lot of sense in making the most immediate local impact. And finally, verifiable additionality. And so again, that's the concept of making sure that the RECs you're purchasing or the renewable energy you're procuring is actually new renewables that is reducing the GHG impact and actually having the impact that you know it's intended to and the message you're portraying. Uh, ensuring that, that additional megawatts of renewables are actually coming online to the grid as a result of your purchase. So RE100 procurement options, the language is slightly different here than some of the procurement options we've gone over, but we still have self-generated electricity, which is direct corporate purchases. We have things like PPAs, uh, which can be both on site, which and sometimes is called a, a solar lease, but it could be a PPA where a developer builds it on site and then you pay them a per kilowatt hour fee. Uh, we could also have things like a direct line to an off-site generator, although that can involve a lot of regulation. Uh, direct procurement from off-site grid-connected generators would be like an off-site uh, PPA. We can also have contract with a supplier. In this case, it would probably be a utility through a green tariff or a, a green program. Um, and we can also have these unbundled rec purchases still. RE100, if none of those options are available, also allows other options to be reviewed by them. As far as technology options, RE100 considers renewable the electricity from biomass, including biogas digesters, geothermal, solar, water, and wind energy. And so it's a pretty wide spectrum of renewables that RE100 allows. But again, we really should be considering what you think is actually best for the, the image you're trying to portray and the message you're trying to send with your renewable purchase. Technical criteria continued. Um, we have some location specifications by RE100. Uh, companies can claim the environmental benefits of renewable energy production by acquiring ener electricity attribute certificates, that's a REC, um, issued by renewable electricity generators operating within the same market boundary as the claimant. So again, here, same market boundary really just means Indonesia. Um, for most part, you know, there have been some edge cases where if if in Timor Leste there is a perfect opportunity for a, a new renewable project and we have a line coming in directly into Indonesia, that maybe we could call that a, a, a same market purchase. But generally, we should be thinking within Indonesia here. And as far as then the unique claim, RE100 defines renewable electricity consumption as the ability to make a unique claim on the use of that renewable electricity. So in countries where no tracking systems are in place, like 
Indonesia for the time being. Um, claims shall be made by transfer of attributes via contracts or other means. And so you would need to submit to RE100 uh, contracts that specifically include a, a stipulation that the RECs or the renewable energy attributes from that generation aren't being sold elsewhere and that no double counting is taking place. So for instance, if PLN wants to sell RECs based on their renewable portfolio, a contract would need to be signed with them that says they aren't going to claim that they are supplying those renewables to other people in their utility network, that no other customers are receiving that renewable electricity. Um, this is all coming from RE100's technical criteria, which is a really useful document, uh, again, if you actually have a, a commitment to RE100. RE100 on their website also puts out annual reports, which I would really recommend everyone look at. Um, there's some really great information in there in terms of success stories, in terms of uh, scaling up quickly, in terms of the different tactics people are taking to meet their RE100 uh, commitments and what different corporates are doing. Finally, looking at RE100 procurement mechanisms or, or methods, this is coming from that RE100 report I just mentioned, and it's really interesting to see the trend here. Um, I, I love seeing data like this. And so in 2015, of the renewables that were procured by RE100 members, only 3% was coming from direct procurement from offsite grid connected generators. And so that, that's a PPA, an offsite PPA. So in 2015, only 3% was going that way. And then we saw a series of massive purchases in 2016, which now has led us closer to 16% in 2017. And likewise, uh, the proportion of RE100 members and the RE100 uh, consumption coming from unbundled energy attribute certificates or RECs has dropped from about 60% down to 46%. So this isn't to say that RECs aren't issued necessarily for those PPA, those direct procurement purchases. They're just, RECs are now being obtained in a bundled fashion. And so RECs are always present as kind of the accounting mechanism here and to ensure that no double counting is taking place. But RE100 corporates on, on aggregate, the trend is for more RE100 to take more of a direct role in procuring renewables rather than just purchasing unbundled uh, contracts, uh, certificates. And contracts with suppliers, and so this would be like a green energy tariff through PLN or something of that sort, um, but it stayed fairly consistent. We're, we're at about the same amount in 2015 uh, as 2017. Um, so those are the end of, of my main slides. I have some other slides that deal with specific examples. And if, if people have questions, I think it would be really helpful to go over some of those examples in the Q&A session. Uh, but for now, I, it was a pleasure talking to you all, and I really hope you took away um, the two key points are that RECs are an accounting mechanism, and we need to be wary of things like double counting when we're, we're first venturing into using RECs. Thanks, Sam. Great presentation. Let's see. So... Uh, we noticed uh, some questions coming in on the pace of the presentation. Sam uh, was working to slow it down a little bit. Uh, hopefully that was helpful uh, when he was able to do that. Uh, again, this will be put up on YouTube, so there will be opportunities uh, if you guys want to go and review some of the stuff. If there were some areas that were a little bit too speedy, maybe you can go back and, and have another listen to those. Uh, and again, if you have any specific questions, uh, feel free to ask us uh, after the presentation or uh, you can put your questions directly in the question and answer question pane and then we'll get to those in the, in the Q&A session. So right now we're going to switch gears and bring in our, our speakers. Uh, so first up we have Roble Valesco Rosenheim. He's from uh, APX, and he's the Asia regional lead there. Uh, he's uh, He oversees the business development and operations in the Asia Pacific region, and he works with corporate energy buyers, project developers, and government agencies to facilitate renewable energy uh, trading. So I will pass off to him.
Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. So I, I think that this means that you guys can all hear me. Is that right? That's correct. I can. That's great news. All right. Well, so we're going to go ahead and put this on the full screen. We can just get that up and running. Move this out of the muted here. Excellent. Let's just close Skype so that we don't get any distractions. Thank you very, very much for having me and for that comprehensive um, overview of Rex. I think really, really helpful. Um, again, my name is Roble Po Velasco Rosenheim. Uh, I'm aware that it's a confusing name and I apologize for that. Um, and yes, again, I'm the regional lead for APX and I work on the Tigers Registry, uh, really helping corporates access renewable energy across Asia. Um, very simply, what APX does is build and operate registries, okay, for environmental attributes, and that includes carbon credits and RECs. Um, and really what a registry looks like is an online bank account. It's a place that you log in, you have a place where you can, if you're a project developer, create a REC. It's a place where you store that REC, you can transfer that REC, you can trade it, and as a corporate buyer, you can purchase it and retire it, okay? But I'm not gonna recap the details on that. Instead, I'm gonna talk to you guys today about two relatively simple concepts, right? And this is, this is uh, specific to Indonesia. Uh, the first of these concepts is really what is on the wish list of a corporate buyer? You know, what you should be considering and asking for uh, if you have a commitment to be renewable, you know, whether it's 100% renewable or otherwise, uh, you know, what you should be asking for and what you want in a given marketplace. So that'll be the first of two things. Um, and the second of those of these two things that I'll touch on is really what you can ask for uh, from, you, from your utility, from policymakers and other stakeholders in that marketplace uh, to get from point A to point B. And point A being, you know, limited availability of renewable uh, options and point B being a flourishing marketplace, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep it simple. We'll talk about, you know, here we are in, on our wish list, right? And apart from there being physical renewable power in your country, uh, you want two things, really. You want a tracking system, uh, which you have now with the Tigers Registry and with IREC, uh, and you want robust procurement options. All right, so as was pointed out earlier, uh, here are some details on what your registry should do or be, right? And the, the first and sort of simplest thing is it should be compliant with the different criteria set out by CDP, RE100, the Science-Based Targets Initiative, um, and sort of the umbrella or guiding document which really helps build those, uh, those criteria out. And that's the Greenhouse Gas Protocol for Scope 2 Emissions, right? So you want your registry or your tracking system to be compliant with each of those. And happily for all buyers in Indonesia, the Tigers Registry and IREC provide those, okay? As noted also before, you want your RECs to be third-party verified. And put simply, that means that when a generator says, yes, I produced one megawatt hour of renewable power, you want a tracking system that talks to a third party that comes in and reads the meter or looks at the financial settlement and says, yep, that developer, that, you know, that producer actually did create that one megawatt hour of power. It was, in fact, renewable, um, and it, was, you know, it, it went into use. There are different um, details and bits of information that a rec should contain, uh, but I'm not going to get into the weeds or the details on that. Um, your rec, as, as described, should absolutely ensure that there is no double counting. Right, so you as the buyer are the one and only buyer and owner of that REC, right? And you want to make sure that that one megawatt hour of power didn't also go and create, for example, a carbon credit. So the issue of no double counting is an important one and really the rationale behind it, in my own opinion, uh, and, and also as detailed in, in the scope to emissions guidelines, uh, is that you wanna be that unique owner so that no one else uh, is boasting or bragging about the fact that they used your renewable power. So you want to make sure there's no double counting. Last but not least, I think that this is, uh, this is often overlooked, 
you want your registry to have a high degree of data security, okay? Um, to the best of my knowledge, APX is currently the only registry operator that goes through service organization control or SOC 2 audits. Um, and the reason that we do that is our, our registries internationally uh, transact in excess of one billion US dollars uh, across markets. And so our stakeholders, including corporate buyers, uh, are very sensitive about that information, particularly if you're someone like um, Apple, Microsoft, or Google, uh, and you have a data center in a given country, the amount of power that you consume at each site is very, very sensitive information, so you want to make sure that your data is secure, okay? So that's, that's what you want in a tracking system. You guys are all very lucky that there is, you know, there are tracking systems in Indonesia, um, and, and we're very happy to be providing that service. So that's tracking systems. Uh, if you look down, you're gonna see an exclamation point, which means that I'm excited about this and I hope that you guys are too. Uh, you want to have robust procurement options. And the next slide is gonna get into more details on what these are, uh, but in very short, you want in a given marketplace in Indonesia to have the option to buy unbundled, bundled, and to execute PPAs. Um, and this is a little chunk of free advice, and that's why I've put the explanation there. Uh, your consumption mix for renewables is something that you should review very often. Uh, and the reason for that is the, you know, the rationale for, for using renewables is in large part um, a narrative one. You want to tell a good story about your renewables. Uh, but if you're, for example, a procurement officer, at you know Adidas or Nike or, or you know H and M, perhaps your corporate office has said now you have to buy renewable energy, and the immediate feeling, you know what what the procurement team often thinks is oh no now I've got to deal with an additional cost, but it's not always an additional cost. So looking at options for power purchase agreements for on-site renewables plus RECs as a tracking mechanism uh, can actually help lower your costs and really build a strong marketing uh, story for your, you know, not only for your, your brand, but also for its supply chain. And so that's the, the, the next and last uh, bullet point on this slide, which says you want to have the ability to build a narrative. In short, you want to be able to tell a good story with the recs that you buy and use. Um, and so that's going to sort of move us on into this here next slide which talks about options, and we'll, we can talk in the question and answer about how to build that narrative, right? Um, we, we spoke briefly about the concept of unbundled RECs and bundled RECs, um, but really what you should be asking for in a given country uh, is that diverse range, right? So when you're looking at unbundled RECs, you as a corporate buyer, you know, one of the first things that you should be asking for in a market is, I wanna be able to talk to the project developers. I want to be able to talk to the traders and to tell them what I want. So you want to be able to say, I want a solar rec from a small project on you know, Bali or a wind, uh, wind farm on Java. And you want to go and talk to that project developer and say, hey, can I buy your unbundled recs? That's not an option in a lot of markets. And it's something that you can work with your utility and with your policymakers uh, to secure, and I can get into more details in the question and answer on how you would go about doing that, right? You want to have an attractive green or bundled product, um, and that's you know specifically talking about what the utility can offer, uh, and on the next sort of large bullet, I'll, I'll talk to you about how you can get those or how you can encourage those to come into the marketplace. Uh, and you want the ability uh, in your power purchase agreements as well as your on-site solar uh, you want the ability to track and measure and report in a very clear and transparent way that you're making impact. Okay, so this is sort of an extension of the wish list. These are the kinds of RECs that you want to have available in Indonesia. Um, and, you know, the next portion here is what the utility can do to enable that, right? So this is where you start thinking, what could I ask PLN to do? And these are some options that you might consider, right? So. If you look at this bullet, it says encouraging independent market growth. It relates directly to the bullet above, which says diverse and unbundled rec options. In short, what this means is, as a registry provider, we need to talk to the utility, we need to talk to the project developers and other stakeholders uh, to ensure 
that the project developer owns the recs. If there is a question of ownership, which means that you know the project developer, the solar farm owner comes to me and says, hey, I want to create a rec and sell it. One of the first things that I'm gonna say is, can you prove to me that you own that rec before, you know, before we generate it? So one of the things that the utility can do to encourage this is in the contract for power that he has with that independent power producer, the utility PLN can sign or add a little clause that says, I'm buying the power, but I'm not going to say that I'm using the renewable, you know? And so what that does is give me APX and the Tigers registry, the ability to easily create that rec and then they can sell it to you. Okay. So that's the first thing you can encourage your utility uh, to, to basically allow the marketplace to grow. So that's first. PLM, like, like basically every other company in the world wants to make money and they have a very, very good opportunity to do so in this marketplace. And they can do that by selling you a corporate power buyer, their physical power plus Rex, their bundled green product. And I think that there's a difference here in between what is in most, you know, what I hear corporates asking me, uh, they say, I want a really good green power program. And I say, well, what does good mean to you? Typically what they say is, well, I want to see that if I buy green power from my utility, that it's not just any green power. I want to see that it's green power that that utility actually generated. And I want to know that the money that I'm spending is going to help build new projects, right? So what PLN is uniquely capable of doing and selling uh, in the Indonesian market is, you know, PLN has a wealth of geothermal energy. So they can generate recs very easily. I, you know, in my own personal opinion, and this does not necessarily represent uh, the, the market opinion, but it's certainly something you hear from corporates. One of the best options for PLN might be to issue recs from its own projects, bundle them with power, and sell them off to you. So that's the second thing that you might be, uh, you might consider asking PLN to do in this market space. Okay. And third, and this is a little bit further down the line, but a very exciting opportunity, um, is PLN can support both producers and consumers uh, to engage in power purchase agreements, right? And they do two main things to encourage that activity. The first of these is say, yes, you, power buyer, can buy power from you, uh, power producer. Um, and we, PLN, using our transmission grids, are going to help you move that physical power, right? So they can enable direct purchase agreements. Now, I say that's further down the line because there's a lot of policy work involved here, uh, but APX is working with government stakeholders across Asia uh, to make this happen in a transparent and credible way. We're more than happy to get involved in the Indonesian market. So the utility here uh, can enable power purchase agreements and they can sign a clause in that contract that says, hey, just because we're helping you move the power doesn't mean that we're going to try and take the recs. You, the, the developer, can easily sell those recs to you, the buyer. Uh, and really, that's, that's it for what I wanted to discuss with you guys today. I think that I promised five minutes, and I probably went around seven or eight, so I'm sorry uh, about that. Unmuted. I'm this useful. Uh, you can contact me at any time. I don't sleep. Uh, my Skype is Roble Po, one word. You got my WhatsApp here. Uh, you got my email address, which is just tigers at apx.com, easy to find. Uh, and I very much look forward to being in touch and uh, to entertaining any questions that you might have. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Roble. Uh, again, if you guys, if the audience has any questions, uh, go ahead and put those in the uh, question pane, and we can direct those over to Roble at the, at the Q&A session. And now I'm going to pass it over to Andrea Yu, who is with the uh, Mount Snowgate Green Asset Management Group. Uh, Andrea is responsible for sales and marketing activities to corporate customers, focusing on providing renewable energy solutions to enterprises with multinational business activities. This includes assisting corporations to see the business case in IREC procurement. So I'll pass that over to you. And let's see, give us a little uh, a heads up there, Andrea, when you're ready. 
you may be on mute. Let's see. Hello. Here you are. Hi. Hello. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Andrew. Are you from mountains today? Uh, due, to, due to time difference, mountains day, mountains mountains get is on behalf I extend to do this presentation and I am the senior manager at mountains get mountains don't get the first Iraq trading company based in Asia uh, we are not only focused on developing Iraq projects but also engage in sales and marketing for the past years mountains get has assisted our corporate buyer to purchase more than 2.5 million IRS. And now let me quickly go over today's main points, the brief introduction of IREX standards. Uh, IREX Center is an NGO based in the Netherlands. It has been active since 2015. It works with independent and local issuers to maintain a transparent attribute tracking standard into local and national system. The IRECO provides a blueprint for a standardized attribute tracking system that can be implemented in any country or regions. Each IREC is unique to a specified megawatt hour of renewable energy production and inclusive have one owner at any time. IRECs are issued against supporting evidence of production events have taken place, for example, using energy settlement metering data. IREC standard is widely recognized by international initiatives such as I-100, CDP, and GH3 protocol scope crew guidance, and so on. There are what we learn from the European market. As we can see, there are three sessions on this slide. The shot tooth is red in America, low green is guarantee of origin in Europe, and the rest of the world, you can see the deep blue regions are red. There are so many local issues in Europe to issue guarantee of original. However, this map is for IREX. In the beginning, the central issuer will take the responsibility to issue the certificate. The goal of IREX standards are pursuing to work with the local partner. Nowadays, the IREX standard board has authorized the latest issuer, you can see on the left, to implement attribute tracking system in 24 countries. Indonesia is also an IREC ready country and Mountains Donga is happy to share our experience with you. So if you would like to more, know more details, please feel free to contact us. And we are partner, partnership with uh, Indonesian based company, so uh, we can get in touch later. And this year IREC standard is also going to organize a workshop in Jakarta. So uh, more details will come out later. And here is my end of my presentation. Thank you for your time. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. All right. Again, any questions uh, for Andrew? Uh, pop those in the question pane. I'll, I'll pass it over here to to uh, Rachel Torada, who's the Director of Technical Projects at CRS. Uh, Rachel leads technical assistance and initiatives for CRS. Uh, recent projects for her have included international expert assistance to government agencies on renewable energy policy design, support for REC tracking system initiatives, as well as industry best practice white papers, and blockchain initiatives for renewable energy markets. Great, thank you very much, Rob, and happy to be here. 
Um, so just as a little way of background, uh, the Center for Resource Solutions, or CRS, we've been around since 1997, and we're a nonprofit, or NGO, and we work on policy and market solutions for advancing sustainable energy. Um, there are sort of three categories of work that we engage with. We're probably best known for our Green E certification program for businesses and individuals that want to go above and beyond government requirements to purchase renewable energy, and we certify the majority of the voluntary market in the U.S. and about 96% of unbundled retail rec transactions in the U.S. We also have a lot of education programs, including our annual Renewable Energy Markets Conference, which we'd love all of you to attend. It's going to be in early September in San Diego, California this year in the United States. But today I'm going to be talking more about our expert assistance and market development work. We do a lot of coaching work, uh, mostly with government agencies around the world on best practices for renewable energy tracking systems and green power offerings. So we do not buy or sell renewable energy and we do not offer tracking system software services like iRecord Tigers, but rather we're an, a neutral independent expert that provides information on global best practices. So here are some examples including several of the tracking systems in the US and in Asia uh, that, we've, uh, that we've helped. Um, and usually we help government, government agencies, as I said, but sometimes also utilities, which is the case in Hong Kong with their lar largest utility, CLP Power. And there's a lot that goes into building a successful voluntary market. And here are some of the key ingredients. So the, mar the policy and market framework is really important. And engagement with regulators and policymakers is key. As well as having products available in the market that purchasers want to buy, right? So one of the first steps in establishing the market infrastructure is allowing for energy attribute cert certificates or RECs to be traded. And setting up a tracking system is, is a really important tool in, in the toolkit there. And then layering certification like Green E on top of tracking systems can also be helpful to enhance credibility. Now with prices, there are different opportunities and challenges in different markets. And I'll touch on that topic at the end, but needless to say, as prices come down, access and engagement in renewable energy purchasing tends to go up. So just to review, we've already seen a lot of this um, for each megawatt hour of renewable energy generation, a REC is created that can be tracked and traded separately from the underlying electricity, and it represents your right to claim that you're purchasing renewable energy or using it. And you can think of RECs as an accounting tool. And there are lots of different ways to buy and sell renewable energy in the voluntary market, but you need to retain the RECs to make a credible renewable energy usage claim. Not all of these options are available uh, in all parts of the world, um, but, but there are, you know, different options emerging in different locations. And each rec has a unique serial number. It can be used or otherwise known as retired or canceled for different purposes. So some of the functions that tracking systems provide include documenting the renewable energy production based on metered data making sure that there's no double counting or double issuance of RECs. Um, facilitating trading, you know, Roble had mentioned uh, thinking of a tracking system account kind of like an online bank account. In this case, it's where your account holds RECs instead of money. So you can see what's in your account and where your RECs come from or are going, but not any other info about anybody else's account. And then for cancellation or retirement, once a REC is retired, it can't be traded or used for any other purpose. Another thing that's not on, really mentioned on this slide, but it can be helpful to consider is that usually tracking systems are policy neutral. So uh, they can uh, engage with compliance markets and also voluntary markets. They don't set the policies, but can track uh, the megawatt hours. Um, for different programs. And here's an example of tracking system operation. So governance structure really varies depending on the country or region, 
whether it's a government agency or an, or an NGO or a for-profit entity that's acting as the tracking system administrator. But often, especially when you're dealing with compliance markets, you'll, you'll have a, a government regulator and a, a stakeholder group or advisory committee feed into the governance structure. And then there's a software system that might be built in-house or use a provider like APX or, or IREC, and it sort of sits in the middle. And uh, the generator data all has to be validated. So there's static data and dynamic data. The static data is generator information like the resource type and the location, et cetera. And the dynamic data is the megawatt hour information, the vintage information. And that's typically the grid operator that's providing that information to uh, the tracking system or another party, what we call a, a qualified reporting entity or a QRE. And then uh, users can have accounts and trade and retire recs within the system. And then program managers like utility commissions that are overseeing compliance markets or certifi certification programs like Green E for voluntary markets can get reports on activity to verify against requirements. I did want to just highlight that there are some policy considerations and interactions. So just because you can track a megawatt hour or a rec doesn't mean that anyone is necessarily going to want to buy it or that they should. So there are a lot of potential policy interactions that need to be considered in both emerging and also in, in the existing markets. So to ensure there's no double claiming, the policy landscape really needs to be considered, especially um, for this concept called regu regulatory surplus and regulatory additionality. So that's uh, making sure that a voluntary purchase and all the included attributes are really going above and beyond any government requirements. So I'm, I, I know we're short on time, so I'm not gonna get into all of these different um, policy interactions, but I will, say, I will just lightly touch on feed and tariffs, um, only because they've sometimes been a little bit of a challenge for voluntary market activity in some emerging Asian markets um, in terms of price. So usually a feeding tariff guarantees a certain price to generators and it's a great policy for getting renewable energy built. However, the right to claim renewable energy delivery usually goes to the utility. You typically can't get voluntary recs from feed and tariff projects and that's to prevent double counting. So developers that are forgoing that feed and tariff price often want to get an equivalent price from voluntary buyers for off-site projects, which can sometimes be high, at least in comparison to, to other uh, markets like in the US. So with that, I'll wrap it up and please feel free to contact me or my colleague, Orrin, who works in international. Great, thanks very much, Rachel. <laughs> So that wraps up the presenters that we have uh, lined up for you guys today. Um, just to provide some additional resources uh, on this topic um, uh, before we get into the Q&A, there are uh, some tools that we have available here at NREL that can help with some of your project development. There's the system advisory model and there's the link there. Uh, the Renewable Energy Data Explorer uh, is a great tool for and data visualizer for renewable energy data source uh, re resource data. Uh, also, again, that can help with, with your project planning and some of your, your long-term goal planning. Uh, you can see both of the links there for those uh, available through the NREL website. And in addition, the CEIA team is doing work in uh, Colombia on uh, similar topics to this. And part of the work that we've done there involved putting together uh, requests for proposals uh, for various corporate buyers. And what we've done through this link here is to put uh, a proposal template together that could be accessed by pretty much anybody around the world. It does have a bit of a Columbia focus, but uh, I think can be relatively easily changed uh, and can be used uh, as you're looking for uh, aspects of various contract uh, requirements or, or key uh, points to include when you're doing the actual actual renewable energy purchases. So this is a little bit outside of the RECs, but uh, as you're thinking of those things down the line, those are some resources that we have for you. 
Uh, and then following on uh, this sort of training, we, we do other types of trainings through CEIA. There's various technical areas that uh, we can we get into, So and we're open to discussing that with uh, various stakeholders, be it businesses or governments or utilities. So if you have any questions on that, please feel free to ask us about those things. Uh, and again, uh, a resource to you will be hopefully the YouTube uh, uh, presentation of this event. So if you have any other questions or would like to be able to forward that out to other folks, you can use that as a resource as well. So uh, with that, uh, I will conclude the main body of the uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to pass it over now to Jenny Heater, who is fielding some of the questions that have been presented online. Uh, again, if you have any other questions that you'd like to ask, please put them into the uh, question pane and we can field those as we get them. Great. Thanks, Rob. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Great. Um, the first question that came in was related to green tariffs. Um, the question was about um, how long-term the contracts typically are under that structure um, and whether, a, whether there is a minimum year uh, requirement for those types of contracts. Um, so I can answer that question. Um, really, the term length is dependent upon um, how many years uh, the generator feels like they need certainty on for financing their project. Um, so typically in the U.S., we see these contracts being 15 to 20 years um, because that's how long generators need uh, revenue certainty in order to finance their projects. Um, but in different markets and in Indonesia, um, that contract length could be shorter or longer. Um, the second question we had, a series of questions actually, is related to rooftop solar projects. Um, which we didn't touch on very much in this presentation. Um, but the question is about uh, rec treatment under those solar rooftop projects. Um, so this corporation has solar rooftop on their facilities in Thailand and Vietnam. And they're wondering how they can check whether they own the recs for um, those rooftop systems um, and whether they need to register those recs um, for those projects. Um, and they did mention that they have a leasing agreement with their developer. Um, so I have some general thoughts and then I would open it up to um, our IREC and um, Tiger's registry folks for, for a minute or two of comments. But um, the first thing I would suggest would be looking at your leasing agreement um, to see whether rec ownership is specified in that agreement. Um, hopefully it is. <laughs> um, and in that case, um, it should be clear whether you all own the RECs from that system um, or whether they're staying with the developer um, and the developer may be selling them on to somebody else. Um, but I guess I would turn it over to um, IREC or um, Tigers folks to see if you guys have commentary on treatment of um, on-site project RECs. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? This is Roble from APX slash Tigers. Yes, can you hear you? Yep, great. Yep. Yeah, um, we can hear you. So, thanks. I mean, so first of all, thank you very much for this, uh, this clarifying question. It's something that we speak with very often um, with project developers as well as the buyers. Um, so I mean, first of all, it's, you know, it's definitely a common question, and it's one which I think there is a lot of ambiguity on in the region, right? So the default answer is, you know, mostly in a, in a contract that does not mention, I mean, so, okay, the, the first thing is look at your contract. Uh, check to see whether there is any mention of environmental attributes, carbon benefits, renewable energy certificates, et cetera. Uh, if the contract mentions it, then that'll, you know, that's your starting point, right? And so if, for example, the project developer owns the environmental attributes, you should definitely open a conversation with them about getting those uh, those recs, right? So there's a difference in between who owns the environmental attribute, which is basically something you can convert into a rec, and actually owning the rec. Uh, to use your, you know, say you're, you know, company A, whoever you are, uh, and you have uh, solar on your rooftop, 
In order to make a credible claim to RE100 um, in a marketplace like Indonesia where there is a tracking system in place, uh, you do need to issue those recs and retire them, right? So if the project developer owns the attributes, they should, you should talk with them about having them use a registry and you can get in contact with me, I can walk you through that. Uh, but they should essentially be issuing them and retiring them in your name. If you are the owner of the environmental attributes, the same conversation takes place. Um, but basically, the, the questions to be asking yourself are who's going to pay the issuance fees, which in Tigers is three cents per rec, uh, to, you know, just to create the physical thing and then retire them. Um, so, I mean, the, the unfortunate answer is that there is no single answer. The, the question of ownership is uh, really on a project by project basis. Uh, but please do reach out by email and we can, uh, we'll help get you sorted out. Great, thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions coming in. Um, and I know we're a little bit over time. So, um, Rob, I think I'll turn it back over to you to, oh, sorry, we do just get one more question <laughs> coming okay. in. Uh, yeah, any last questions? So please type them in before we close out. Um, there's one more question about, um, does the country need to set up an approval mechanism to be a compliance market for RECs? Um, Rachel, maybe I'll direct that one to you guys talking about um, how, yeah, countries can, can develop compliance markets for RECs. Sure, yeah, and so the countries can definitely set up compliance markets, um, usually through law, and then uh, regulators will usually be on the hook for um, uh, demonstrating that uh, compliance is, is being met um, by utilities. And so um, typically a tracking system can be really helpful for that, and uh, and usually um, regulators like utility commissioners will have, or commissions will have accounts within the tracking system. And they'll do things like approve facilities um, to be, uh, to make sure that they're meeting all the criteria that's in, you know, a renewable energy quota, quota statute or a renewable portfolio standard. And uh, they'll also, um, want to take a look at all of the retirements from um, any obligated entities for that uh, quota system or for that compliance market or for RPS. And so um, uh, anyone who participates in those markets needs to be able to show um, those, those regulators um, the appropriate retirement reports. So uh, there needs to be um, interaction between the regulators and, and whatever the approved tracking system is. Usually there will be one system that's used and oftentimes that same system will be used for voluntary markets as well. Great, thank you. Um, I'm not seeing any more questions roll in. Um, so we we'll just remind folks that the presenter contact information is in the slide deck if you do have additional questions. Um, and Rob, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thanks very much, Jenny. And thank you all for calling in and participating this morning. Uh, hopefully you were able to uh, get some good information from our expert speakers here. I appreciate uh, our, our speakers as well taking the time to join us uh, for this presentation. Uh, again, if you have any questions that you'd like to ask them directly or anything that you'd like to ask the CEIA team, you can see our contact information there. Uh, and if you didn't catch the contact information for the presenters, feel free to reach out to me and I can provide that uh, information to you as well. Uh, again, thank you all for joining and we look forward to the next steps in this, which is hopefully over the next uh, couple of weeks, putting together um, a, a kind of package of uh, uh, concerns for us to be able to discuss with PLN uh, directly about some of these RECs issues. Thank you all very much and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.